Hi, I'm Daniel Myers, Developer Relations here at Snowflake. And this is another episode of Behind the Data Cloud. Today, I'll be interviewing James Weekly, one of our more active members within our community. He's had uh, direct contributions to our open source projects on Snowflake Labs. We're gonna be talking a little bit about his background uh, in the data space um, and as a developer for uh, uh, working on Snowflake. Um, and so James, you know, how are you today? Really well, thank you, Daniel. And it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, so tell me a little bit about kind of the, your journey as a Snowflake customer uh, and the background of, you know, kind of how your company got started. Yeah, sure. So I've been pre prior to this, I've been a Snowflake customer at two different um, companies um, and NIB who were the, I think the first health insurer on, on Snowflake. Um, and so this was, um, this was a few years ago now, I think two and a half years ago, um, you know, helping deploy soft, uh, Snowflake at that company um, really <clears throat> was some of my earlier contributions to the to the Snowflake ecosystem, which was really just, you know, plugging the small holes that existed as we deployed it in our particular environment. So anyone who's had the challenge of, um, you know, wanting to demonstrate something, um, you know, that, that looks real, but you'd these particularly these days you shouldn't definitely not use production data in demos or test environments um, there's been a popular way to do this in the software engineering community for years which is you know these fake data generation libraries and probably the most well known is called faker it's been ported to all the major languages um, including python um, and so I, I would find myself and i'm sure lots of um, Snowflake staff and customers have been in the same boat where you need to generate a ton of um, of fake data that kind of looks realistic and maybe millions or billions of, of records. And previously I would run that say on Python locally into a CSV and then I would up upload it to Snowflake and, um, and, and, and deal with all of that. Um, so recently I decided to take the Python um, I, I'd been meaning to, to do a deep dive on external functions as well, which kind of came together really nicely. I thought, well, now that you can run Python scripts in, invoke them from the database engine, then um, I can solve this problem by combining the two. So um, I could do a quick demo of, of Flaker now, if yeah. you like. Yeah, so yeah, please. let me share my screen. So here's the, the Flaker repository on GitHub. Uh, it will be under Snowflake Labs um, slash Flaker. Um, so what it is, is a, um, a simple Python script, which takes um, the input that you send it from the Snowflake function and calls the, all it does is call the Python Faker library. So it's all, um, it's all contained in that library and then returns the result back to Snowflake. So most of the code that you see is actually kind of the scaffolding of the, of the function, the actual call to the Faker library is only, only a few lines of code. And so, um, so for those that, that aren't familiar with these faking libraries, right? Like the generating fake data. So can you tell a little bit about like what the external function, what it's actually doing, and how is it how is it generating fake? You know, so so if they get you know if they request a name, it'll just create yep. a fake name, right, or an address. It'll, That's it right. Has, it'll just generate address. Yeah. So sure. What what it does um, from the Snowflake point of view is once you've created the external function, you can just call it from in the database engine. So here, I'm basically just generating fifty. Um, using a generator to generate 50 rows. And I've decided to create uh, a name, an address, a job title, uh, and a company uh, in the US English locale. That could be, I mean, that's just generating a table. The other thing you can do is, is incorporate it into say an update statement. So if you had, um, I don't know, 5 million customers in your database and you 
wanted to restore it somewhere else and maybe um, build some stuff around it. Um, but you wanted to do the right thing and not have your real customers in a test environment. Um, when you did say your zero copy clone from production, you could then run an update statement to say, well, just keep all the names where they are, um, but just replace them with fake ones. And the great thing about fake, uh, the Faker library is it works in all different languages and regions as well. So if I wanted to say, instead of a US address, I want to say, let's go with Denmark. Um, you just swap out the locale and then these are suddenly addresses in Denmark instead of the US. So um, very flexible library. It's got heaps of um, heaps of different what they call providers, which are like generators of fake data. You can generate things like bank data, um, uh, just company titles and roles and locations. Um, a lot of personal information like phone numbers, it will generate phone numbers that are valid. Um, it would generate credit card numbers. Um, so like you said, I mean, there seems like a like like a, an amazing way to test, you know, so to to incorporate into a software development workflow as a, as testing data inside your database. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's that's right. Um, and you can also extend it if you've got a you know a particular um, type of or. or um, structure of data that's unique to your your um, vertical or your industry, um, you can actually add um, like a plugin for Faker to if you just show it, you know how to generate um, a particular number or a particular piece of text. You can do that as well. You can essentially create your own provider. That's right. Awesome. Yeah. So that's the that's the most recent one, um, and you know I think it's had a had a good reception i think a lot of people are using it already um and so yeah that, that was kind of fun to build um it was a good a good showcase of um external functions which i think are a really cool development so um it's really good as a as an engineer who's come from this kind of cloud infrastructure background into the the data warehousing space to see um, all these familiar um, uh, concepts and abilities kind of converging in in the data warehouse, like it, you know, you, there's always been some awkward way to to build really custom things in databases. And I do remember the days where you'd compile some C function or 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 Java um, file and like copy it onto the database server, and hopefully it all worked out. Um, but <laughs> I think this this new wave of hey well Snowflake sits on public cloud and public cloud has all this cool stuff we can tap into and starting to see now those those two worlds colliding I'm I'm really excited about that. Absolutely, yeah, me too. And so you know, taking it from here, you know, what do you think? You know, uh, if if somebody wants to contribute to one of these projects or use one of these projects um, in their own setups, uh, how can they get involved? Yeah, so there's there's a few ways. I mean, the 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 simplest way is to go to the Snowflake Labs GitHub repository. Um, if you're familiar with how GitHub works, you know it's a whole social coding platform um, built off an existing um, version control system called Git, um, but it really brings a a global collaborative um, lens to that. So you can fork these repositories. You you, you don't need mine or Daniel's permission to do that. You can just create create your own fork, experiment with it, uh, make changes. Uh, if your changes end up being something you think everybody else would um, would appreciate, or if you fix a bug or anything like that, or even if you fix um, the documentation, um, documentation fixes are, are always welcome. Um, then you can open a pull request and um, and it could be merged back in and. And you can call yourself a contributor. It's really exciting. Um, and, and once you go down that path, you know it, it, it sort of feels natural to keep doing it throughout your career, and um, you find yourself contributing to to sometimes big projects with lots of people on them, and you you make your own little um, contribution. But um, it's it's the the exciting world of um, of of software communities, really. 
Um, the other resource I'd point people to is developers.snowflake.com, um, which is quite new. Um, but it's really, um, if especially if you're from a, a general engineering sort of background, um, it you'll see some very familiar um, concepts there. It it um, talks a lot about um, things like um, how to get started with your particular language. So you might think, well. I'm a .NET developer, where do I fit into all this? Um, it's really good at saying, well, we've, we've got a section for .NET developers to here's your first code snippet to get you started and, and you can go from there. That's great. Yeah, so de definitely Snowflake Labs is a great way to get started. Developers.snowflake has a lot of really good resources on how to, uh, on just how to get started on Snowflake and how to start developing on top of Snowflake. So I want to talk again about, uh, you know, some of the the newer features that you've been utilizing on Snowflake, right? So you talked about uh, external functions, right? Uh, and and how we you, you built uh, Flaker using external functions. Um, what are some of the more uh, excited things that that you're excited about as far as you know, uh, like what you can do with external functions or some of the other features of, of Snowflake that you've used that you think are really powerful? Yeah, I. I can, I'm actually, this is really old news now, but I'm still really excited about data sharing. Um, and I'm going to use that even though it's been around for years, because I feel like it hasn't yet been fully realized by everybody. Um, it was originally the, um, you know, sometimes when you, you're in a, you know, enterprise environment and you're, you're buying some software and you've got a, you, you think, you know, you know what what types of things you need to look for in in the product that you want to buy um but then when you start looking at the market there's actually things that you didn't realize you needed that actually are um really important so that for for me at the time was data sharing like we just wanted a cloud data warehouse that scaled nicely and um really utilized the cloud in the way that um that that, that we had been in our own apps um, so Snowflake was 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 the answer there as a data warehouse product, but I remember data sharing thinking um, oh, I didn't even actually it didn't occur to me that that would be a side effect of of a cloud data warehouse. So um, I'm still finding um, data sharing a very compelling thing, and I think because it's um, it's it's something that traditionally hasn't been possible. Um, it's taken a while for people to really use it because people go into Snowflake thinking, I need to build a new, I need to migrate my data warehouse. I need to get it all set up. Um, and maybe one day I'll, I'll share some data with some other um, companies. But in both my um, enterprise roles that I've been in, um, data sharing was really useful and um, particularly, um, you know, other partners who happen to be using Snowflake um, being able to create a table uh, or even a function and share it with them um, just cuts out a lot of um, integration work. Um, so I'm, I'm still um, I'm, I still think about the applications of data sharing quite a bit. Um, the other, I guess, external functions. I think it's um, it's a very generic capability. So um, you know, Flaker was probably the first time where I thought um, this is this is a great way to solve this problem. Um, Definitely. But I mean, like another great thing about about external functions is you know you it's a it's a way to tap into third party APIs leveraging data in Snowflake, right? So for example, you know if you have strings of text and you want to translate that text using something like you know, uh, some translation API, right? You could have, uh, you could translate an entire table with a simple query that's that's utilizing external functions, right? So yeah, yeah. I, I totally agree. You know, how can, how can, you know, some of the audience, uh, you know, learn more about you, um, uh, you know, read some of your material that you've written online. Uh, how can they get involved with you? My, probably my most active channels would be LinkedIn and Medium. So um, that's, you can, you can look me up there and, and follow me. And I usually, anything I contribute to Snowflake Labs, I'll usually post on LinkedIn. 
um, also Medium, so you can follow you can follow Snowflake on Medium, and you will probably see things from me occasionally amongst other other people. Um, or you can also follow me directly on Medium as well. Uh, I think I'm just James Weekly. Um, people can also follow on, you on GitHub, right? They don't just get get all instant. instant yeah, I I always forget that GitHub has that feature. I don't tend to think of um, I tend to think of GitHub as projects rather than people, but you're right. You can actually follow a person. Um, but yeah, you can you can go in and um, follow Snowflake Labs. You can star the repositories that you're interested in, and if if um, you need to find them quickly or you want to um, keep up to date with changes that are being made in the the projects that you follow, then then that's also um, a possibility. Well, great. Great. Well, James, thank you for coming on today. Uh, I want to thank you for uh, for going over all the projects that you've done. Uh, it's been really good. My name is Daniel Myers, and thank you everybody for tuning in today for Behind the Data Cloud. Thank you. <laughs>